Basically, uh, this panel is very interesting to me in particular, because as many of you, we have suffered the um, pandemic, uh, the pandemic effects, right? Uh, I don't think there is uh, any industry that has not suffered it either because the demand went away or was reduced, or the demand got increased in many in, in many uh, type of industries. In our case, in the automotive industry, fortunately, we're seeing that the demand has been sustaining, but also has brought some uh, challenges, right? Um, not only the pandemic, but the, the, the last uh, event of the uh, environment uh, effects that we had in, in, in the United States impacted us as well. And always those challenges uh, make us think what can be done better? What are the tools that are available out there in order to uh, keep up the pace of our customers, protect our customers, the delivery? And uh, um, how can we work smarter? How can our processes uh, uh, have a, a more, a more um, effective uh, usage, right? So that's basically the, the, the background of this uh, uh, topic, the, the smart manufacturing after the pandemic. And I would say, I, I wouldn't say after, we have not uh, done with the pandemic, right? It's, I think uh, this is a new reality and it's gonna continue, uh, hopefully um, not for many years, but I think that there are some things that uh, we have learned and um, uh, some of those uh, comments are gonna be reflected in the participations of you guys. So uh, I would like to uh, start with the, with the first uh, uh, participation. Uh, and it's, it's Matt, Matt, uh, welcome. And um, I don't know if you would like to just uh, state your position in your company as well. And uh, uh, basically, if you can talk, us, uh, talk to us about how these pandemic uh, times have accelerated the transition to a digital world of the processes and which would be the first steps that you envision and you would recommend to a, a company that is starting that process. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me and uh, it's good to be on this panel and talking about the current events with uh, the new world. I say the new world we're living in now. So, uh, but we're all uh, adapting and adjusting. So. So Matt Myron, I work at Forcia uh, up in our Auburn Hills office, just uh, north of Detroit. I'm in charge of our advanced manufacturing and supply chain role. So basically that's our manufacturing innovation group. Uh, so what we do is we trial a bunch of new solutions, uh, whether it's a solution with a startup an established supplier partnerships with universities. And then once we validate that that digital solution is good to go, there's a business case behind it, then we move it into our toolbox. Um, to touch on your question, so, so maybe the first step is what do you do or how do you start your digital transformation journey and what did we do? Really what we had to look at is, is what was our long-term vision, right? So what was our five-year vision of where we needed to be? And then what are the different building blocks to get to there? And, and it's almost like uh, a Lego set. Each solution needs to build on top of the next solution. And ensuring that you had that long-term vision of where you wanted to be, but then the small steps to get there for sure. So really uh, step one was start collecting data, right? Because in the end with the digital transformation and, and providing value for the manufacturing facilities, collecting data, and really I say all data, because you never know what's gonna be the most valuable, machine data, process data, employee data, what are the ideas that the employees have? And then really using that data to help drive change. And then just do it, just jump right in and start uh, the digital transformation. So then now if we look back in 2019 and how did that pandemic really affect our digital transformation journey? Uh, it, because we were about 20% less sales last year, we knew we needed to become more efficient, right? So using that data to help augment the operators to give them more instruction, more guidance, uh, better tools to tune in the machines to make sure the machines were staying efficient, uh, making good parts, uh, reducing the scrap numbers. But then one of the other key points because of the pandemic is we wanted to limit the number of travelers that we had to our facilities. So what we looked at is some uh, mixed reality solutions. So the HoloLens 2 solution was one that we picked. And basically what that enables is the team in the plant can then connect remotely 
uh, with a pair of HoloLens glasses to their um, uh, to the expert, uh, whether it's up in uh, Auburn Hills here, whether it's a machine builder, a tool supplier, or a uh, expert over in Europe in some of our tech centers there. So really bringing that remote assistance on site without having the actual visitor there. And of course it reduces in travel costs as well and reactivity time. So, so maybe that was one key one that moved up on the priority list that we had uh, during the pandemic and really uh, bubbled to the top. Yeah, very well. Five year vision, huh? <laughs> and it's still going, it's still going. It's still going, <laughs> it's still going. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure none of the ladies that are here remember those telephones where you had to, a keypad and you had to press buttons and um, but uh, try to talk to one of those and it's not going to answer right now a phone <laughs> and we'll react to it and digital as you say is a, a tool that will enable or facilitate the interaction right yeah. we, we, and we'll make it uh, uh, able to work with it remotely very very important topics thank you um, so uh, we have uh, Alejandro, Alejandro from Siemens. Hello, Alejandro. Hi, hi, Tarcisio. <laughs> Welcome. Nice here. Welcome, good to have you here. And uh, I would like to ask you, in this uh, digital world, as we are saying, all the information, and, and, and as Matt was saying, you, we need to capture as much as we can in order to make out uh, the most of it. And, uh, but all that data, uh, requires a uh, management and uh, requires storage and requires um, an analysis and all that, right? So uh, that that is a, a challenge uh, uh, for for many many companies. And um, uh, in in this case, um, we have seen lately that the clouds are becoming popular in data management uh, uh, um, service providers. How would you describe that and how can that uh, uh, improve or accelerate the adoption of digitalization in the, in the, in the companies? So thank you, Tarcisio, and, and thanks for the invitation. And it's a, it's a very, very important topic. I, I believe that uh, what we say is data is the new oil because, uh, I mean, we see it in, in our private lives as well. I mean, how much we rely now on on virtual tools, on internet connections, even at home or, or at work to make our, our lives feasible. I mean, I, I, we cannot imagine now our, our lives without uh, internet connectivity and data management. Um, so it's unquestionable that, that we are driving in a very accelerated way to, um, to a digital world. The question is then, how do we, what, what do we do with the data? And, and uh, especially in automotive, it's, it's, it's very, very important because tons of data, it's being generated daily or by the minute. Question is what to do with that. And, um, and what we are driving is, is the concept of, of having a digital twin of, of the vehicle in, in, in software and data environment. Uh, for for many reasons, I mean, if we if we can connect or bridge the the digital with the real model of the car, uh, we have plenty of benefits, and and, and we have uh, we have therefore this embedded in, in our digital enterprise uh, strategy, which which really aims to have a, a digital twin from the from the very beginning of the whole, of the process. I mean, we we, we could have or we have. Uh, a digital model of the car for the development and the research of, of a new vehicle. And then, and then we could have also a digital model of the manufacturing of the vehicle before we actually build the plant. When we build the plant, then we can connect both worlds, the digital and the virtual ones. And, and when we have the car at the end, um, we do connect the car more and more to the cloud to gather data of usage and, and, and service. So, uh, and, and what for? It's at the end, it's, it creates value for all the stakeholders. Um, what, what do I mean with this? Value for, for the user, for the buyer of the car, because it's, it, it could have 
um, more advice on, on maintenance, um, more value of the car. It could have preventive maintenance. It could react before something happens, before it fails. More value for the manufacturer because, uh, because you have um, in a virtual environment much easier uh, commissioning, much, much easier changes in production before you do it in real life. And, uh, and therefore, it's important to have the digital twin of the whole process. And I have a couple of examples that, that makes it basically make the point here. Um, one is a recent new factory in Vietnam of, uh, automotive, of the automotive industry called VinFast, in which together with a customer with this digital twin process of virtual and real world, we were able to have the first car in a greenfield factory in less than two years, from zero to having a serial production of a car, which usually takes twice as much. So we reduce the time by 50% of having from, from zero to a serial production of a car. And then the other one is uh, with Porsche in, in Germany. Uh, and this is for service uh, using augmented reality for the service technician. So the service technician has smart glasses and he's able to see the, the virtual and the real car at the same time. And, and with that, he's able to get advice on, on how to repair a specific part of the vehicle without having to read uh, a 500 pages manual and, and have it in, in, in memory. So, so you have an instant feedback on what's going on and what's to be done. So and these are just a couple of examples of what's the value of digitalization and a proper use of data to create value for all the stakeholders. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, what you mentioned is amazing. The future has come. Now what we do with it, right? Because it's uh, the, the uh, environment is required to enhance the customer experience and the, and the industry needs as well. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Very interesting. And uh, Marcio, how are you doing? Good, Tarcisio. Pleasure to be here. Welcome, welcome. So everything comes down to one particular topic, right? Money, 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 and money in some cases. So uh, the speed that that is required the the new times in order to absorb or uh, move to a a, a digital world requires uh, uh, sometimes uh, resources. So how, how do you think uh, um, operations are gonna face this and how can they start uh, uh, incorporating those uh, type of tools in the, in the processes? Yeah, um, yeah, first of all, I think as my colleagues uh, talked about, and I like talk about myself first, right? Marcio Delgado, I'm, uh, Vice President of Manufacturing Systems uh, and uh, of uh, North American Production for uh, ZF, our division of uh, active safety uh, systems. Uh, and I'm based in the US in, in the region of Detroit. Pleasure to be here, especially uh, as it linked, is linked to Mexico, a uh, country that's so important for automotive industry globally and obviously for ZF as well. So it's a pleasure and thank you for the introduction. Um, well, the, um, my, my colleagues talked about digital manufacturing and of course uh, we at CF uh, also value uh, the same way that uh, my colleagues pointed out. Uh, and uh, we, I, I will approach it uh, from a, a diff different types of examples that we have used at CF uh, um, after the, we cannot say after the pandemic and I think uh, as you mentioned, the pandemic is not over, right? We still went through it and we had to learn quickly uh, in terms of uh, being able to utilize the, um, the, uh, the solutions that are available to us in terms of, uh, of availability of technology. Um, this is an interesting question because we, we, we did have to learn very quickly. Uh, in the, if you look at ourselves in manufacturing, um, you know, Given the importance of, uh, of optimizing business results, uh, given that it's magnified uh, significantly in such a severe and adverse situation, right? 
we manufacturing our contribution, our main contribution is mostly in optimizing resources uh, and the cost to execute product transformation. So that, that includes input costs and investments, uh, logistics costs and uh, speed of logistics and transformation costs in our factories. So with the pandemic, we had to um, ensure that we have timely visibility of a fast changing dynamic environment. Uh, and so uh, changing customer demand, very, very little or zero warning, right? That was one, one of the examples. Uh, high level of uncertainty as it relates to availability of raw material from a global supply base that uh, all of us, I'm sure, are involved with. Complicated global, re global and regional logistics, further complicated uh, with, with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, and of obviously very, very important that we had to make sure that we did all this in a manner that uh, protected our employees uh, given you know the health the health risks. So we we, um, we we had more and more the need to rely on agile tools to provide such visibility and uh, and I'll walk through some examples that that uh, we uh, applied at ZF. Um, we, in, and I'm, I'm going to skip the part of uh, of digital twins because we've already talked about it and, and by, by the other um, panelists. But uh, we one example is that we use uh, significantly we're still using the Power Platform, uh, Power BI, and Power Apps to enhance our visibility of manufacturing data um, for daily management of the plant. You know, of course, as you as you if you are at the plant, it's easier if you meet as a group in a conference room as a workshop to make decisions and look for opportunities for continuous improvement and also for the daily operations of the factory. We allowed for two levels of information. One is information pulled directly from the PLCs of our machines to gain speed um, so that the plant management and the, the shop floor team can have virtual uh, remote information to make the daily decisions and uh, allowing for um, uh, management of the plant on a virtual manner without having to join together uh, and have that ability to do, to do so remotely. And the other level is allowing the, um, the, the, the virtual workshops to make decisions based on a global benchmark, looking at other factories, other regions, other, other facilities, so that we can learn and deep dive into different solutions and apply them globally to 200 or so plants that we have at, at ZF. So those are a couple of uh, simple examples that I want, want to mention here today. We created ways for uh, conducting audit, audits with remote assessors uh, globally uh, that we can have teams from one region conduct audits and evaluations and assessments of plants in other continents and regions in the world as well. So um, very, very wide range of use of digital uh, tools that also uh, foster the uh, development of a digital culture in the company. Thank you. Very true, Marcio, thank you very much. And um, speed, logistics, visibility, and you talk about um, uh, one of the uh, main topics in this world right now, which is the safety and health of our people. And uh, Manuel, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And um, uh, uh, I will uh, ask you to also introduce yourself, but uh, I would like to uh, uh, tell us your point of view in terms of how the new technology and um, all the uh, digital world that is coming uh, as a tool can help us to keep our people safe and healthy. Absolutely. Uh, can you hear me right? That's uh, that's the evolution. That's that's how this new normality uh, has impacted us. Now every single meeting starts with "Can you hear me now?" So um, yeah, definitely. It's uh, uh, we, we're in, on times that um, that are different, and uh, and as things evolved and uh, with COVID, I think that uh, accelerated some of of, of those evolutions. There have been a lot of changes, and uh, safety, of course, has always been 
concern for all manufacturers of technology to have technology that is safe on its use, that uh, can be applied in a safe way. Safety also relates in the hands of the people using the technology and uh, using it properly. But, uh, but I think that also this new normality has uh, come to impact the way we manufacture, the way we lay our manufacturing facilities, because we not only have to consider, like my um, uh, friends here mentioned, uh, return investment, uh, productivity, also we have to consider the safety of what's probably uh, the most important uh, active that we have, which is our employees and, and the way they operate. So now we have another factor to look for when we are trying to implement automation that uh, is not only uh, attractive in the sense of, again, uh, a financial benefit, uh, but also that is effective and that also keeps our employees safe in, in this new environment. Um, we've definitely seen more interest in, in our technologies uh, in a way of uh, separating uh, some of those areas are not, that cannot be easily automated with machines and that you still have a lot of uh, hand labor, but you need to um, adjust and, and keep safe distances between them without affecting much your, your processes and the way it flows. And through uh, technology like uh, universal robots and, and, and others, uh, we've seen that opportunity that you can maintain the productivity, maintain the safety of your employees, and it does not, won't require a big investment or big changes in the way you manufacture. And, uh, and when I see other technologies, you guys mentioned also virtual reality is another one that has kept employees separated, but at the same time communicating and working together. So I think that we are starting to see uh, what was coming in a much more accelerated way in, in the way that we have to interact with each other and that we have to operate through technology in order to be safe. So um, I, I think that's a, a positive thing after all the uh, negative, negativity that a pandemic can bring um, that, uh, that the, through the use of technology, we're also able to uh, not only meet our demands, but also uh, maintain um, uh, our employees uh, safe. So uh, I definitely, I think that every, every company has done their part. It's uh, on their own well-being and, 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 uh, and interest. And I think that we're gonna start seeing more and more uh, new technologies that will help with this new uh, normality that, that, that we face now. Thank you, Manuel. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, and, and we, we have seen a, a shift completely in the way we were working, as you were mentioning, uh, the proof is here. This uh, event now being held uh, through distance as, 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 uh, um, as uh, Matt was saying, remotely in many aspects, right? Many, many aspects of the, that. And, and Marcio, um, I would like to get your opinion also on, on, on how is this handle in terms of um, all the integration of all the data, all the systems, everything. How do you foresee this is gonna be in the near future for the industry in terms of, uh, 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 we had seen already a uh, uh, 4.0 industry with all the internet uh, connected things. Uh, how do you see this is gonna be impacted and accelerated as well? Yeah, it, interesting um, because you know maybe if I if I say that a short term short medium term objective of most manufacturers, and if I say a set of objectives, I, I would say it's probably um, uh, probably to uh, use this dig, dig, digitalization to uh, to maximize competitive advantages, to automate processes, um, and develop unique selling points around intelligent products and processes and use data to, to accelerate the, the, the cultural, uh, di the digital culture, as I was saying, right, or, or, or organizational learning. Then, of course, it requires a lot of data. It requires an immense amount of data that needs to be uh, stored and managed and analyzed 
uh, and made available um, uh, and shared, um, sometimes not only internally within a company, but also with customers and suppliers, uh, as, as I was describing a little bit earlier. So, so you're right, how is this going to be, right? It's, um, there's so many, so many uh, uh, tools now that are developed or, or, or uh, platforms that are developed to store and manage data. And I think that's going to become more and more important. Uh, you know, Microsoft, for example, and others are, are have large uh, supply uh, of services for cloud, cloud services, edge services, and so forth. They're, they're going to become more and more important. Um, and, uh, you know, and now I mentioned the link directly to equipment PLC, which, you know, as you can imagine, the amount of cybersecurity risk that this, this could generate if these systems, uh, and, uh, you know, enforcing the need for these systems to be completely secure and allow for safe uh, uh, exchange of data. So uh, very, very important. I think that development is going to continue for many years. It has developed significantly over the last few years. And I see that as being a key part of uh, the near future. Thank you, Marcio. And Manuel, all, as we were saying before, all this translates into money. Our market, uh, automotive market is a very competitive uh, market in terms of uh, uh, prices and, 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 and um, all the um, uh, globalization that we have seen, right? So how do you see um, uh, the strategies, which would be the strategies the company need to focus on in order to uh, stay competitive? Yeah, absolutely. Money, money is king always. You know, you you, you got to look for your uh, your bottom line, especially in this environment that is ex extremely competitive. And uh, um, and I think it starts uh, from from the root. It's not just you know get cheap technology and because uh, that's just going to have a, a negative impact. Uh, but it starts even from from um, uh, and that's something that we've gotten involved more in teaching the. Uh, um, the people that are implementing that technology to be able to properly calculate a return on investment so that uh, they're certain that they are taking into account all the factors when investing in technology. When it comes to the technology, of course, you want something that is going to do the job that, that is required, that is going to cover your pain points, but also that um, I believe that it's important that this technology has a certain degree of flexibility as well. We are just talking about an unexpected change in the environment on the way we do things, which was the COVID. Nobody expected this, and and we're still learning, you know, how we need to change and how all of this pandemic is affecting uh, not only the markets, uh, the uh, tendencies of of, of the uh, of the consumers, but also how we manufacture things. And uh, uh, so I, I believe that a key part is flexibility as well. If you uh, are going to do a huge investment in the technology that it's just going to serve a certain model or it's just going to serve in a certain way and that changes and you have to then make another investment to reapply that technology that's going to have a huge impact and your bottom line if you invest in technologies that have the ability of, of being flexible of, of changing with the changing environment if you need to change the type of product that you're manufacturing how you're manufacturing the product that internally you have the capability of changing that technology as well and i think that's 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 a key factor in, um, in taking the decision on on when and how to to put your money. Um, many, especially of the uh, small uh, uh, manufacturing companies, uh, maybe a tier three, that that they are you know trying to compete in, in a larger market. One of the biggest problems they have when they go into automation is a lack of flexibility that usually represents. And uh, when you in that at some point translates into having also a huge dependency on labor. Labor is also a, a kind of a difficult investment in the sense that uh, as you have rotation and it's a constant investment in hiring people, making it attractive for, for your um, operators to work with you, having to train them and retrain them when, they, when somebody leaves and uh, all of that play huge impact on, on the cost of your manufacturing, especially for smaller companies. The ability of being able to invest in a technology that 
can adapt to that flexibility that you can use and automate areas where you haven't been able to automate before uh, plays a good factor. Another one is uh, also uh, learning you know, about technology. We've done a lot of studies on, uh, on, uh, on, on robotic arms and we've seen that a, a robotic arm next to an employee working together uh, in, a, in a station is 85% more productive than the robot itself or the worker itself. So the interaction between automation and, and, uh, and, and hand labor has a huge impact. Sometimes just having certain type of automation between somebody making uh, uh, a repetitive labor has an impact because the machine is setting the, the pace at which you need to work. And, uh, and for humans to maintain a certain pace is not always, um, uh, um, they're not always able uh, and maintain the same productivity. So um, I think that uh, you, it's a mistake just to look at the, at the price. And unfortunately we still see that a lot. Uh, there's, there's a lot of factors that, that, uh, that involve a right decision in, in automation when it comes to uh, true return of investment of, of, of your machine there, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and uh, uh, talking about uh, robots, robots, those were prohibitive at some point of time, years ago. And um, before, well, not necessarily prohibitive, but uh, uh, very costly, uh, huge investments because uh, they were not necessarily safe uh, to work next to. So you have to do an investment in in protecting your workers around them, and. Uh, as efficient and fast as they continue to be, uh, it requires a lot of knowledge or investment in people that know about robotics and, and uh, not only in implementing or making changes in the programs. Uh, the robotic has uh, evolved in the latest years to become more flexible, safe next to humans. You can work on a, uh, a collaborative environment. Um, in, in our case, they've also become um, very easy to program, therefore, you don't need external resources or to invest in people that uh, need to have huge amounts of knowledge on different programs, uh, whatnot, to be able to maintain or to make those changes in the technology. Now the same operator can do that. So they're becoming more of a tool than just a machine. So now when they become a tool, that's when you start experiencing what is the productivity, the real productivity of combining automation and men together. And that, that is some mindset and technology change. And uh, one of the um, big changes that we're seeing in the industry, and uh, Alejandro, I want to ask you to what's here. Uh, in terms of uh, all the electric vehicles that are coming in the near future, many, many news about uh, companies moving to electrical vehicles. How is that going to impact uh, or, or, or uh, the existing manufacturing structures? It's a very, very important question because it's a, it's a trend that we cannot stop. I mean, the, the world is becoming more electric um, day by day. I mean, we see that in the, in transportation with the e-cars, also with the, with the trains and, and the dependency, we have more and more of, of let's say, internet connectivity. So, um, so the question is, wh what's the impact and where what are we going to do about it? Um, so in regards of e-cards, there are two uh, topics which are key. One is the, the vehicle production as, as such. And the other one is the, the e-charging infrastructure to make, to make the e-vehicle e model or market uh, flourish and, and thrive. So, um, so in these two things, uh, there are very important developments now happening. So one is uh, in, in production, new technologies are, going, are being implemented today to make, to make the production smarter. For instance, um, we are uh, making the, uh, the PLCs and the whole automation structure more intelligent by the use of uh, AI. So artificial intelligence is getting more and more involved in, in automotive production, especially with the battery and e-motor production. Um, 
then uh, we see more use of automated guided vehicles for the logistics inside the plant. We see more and more the use of, of the cloud. I mean, in our case, Siemens, we, we have a, uh, an IoT platform uh, what we, that we called MindSphere, which is an basically IoT ecosystem that comprises apps to make sure to, to enable the production to run in a more intelligent way and gather data and make good use of the, of the data. Um, the other trend that, that we are seeing is the, um, the electrification also of, of all the processes, making sure that the, the machines and the battery production runs on a digital twin model, which I explained before from the design, manufacturing, and also serial production and, and service of the car, of the e-car in this case. So um, the other technology that it's, it's, it's coming is the autonomous vehicles, autonomous driving vehicles. And, um, and for this also for the operation and for the manufacturing of this type of cars, uh, you require very quick connectivity, low latency communications. And for this, the new standard coming up, which is the 5G um, wireless standard is, is very important. So for production, we're gonna see more and more the usage of 5G um, with in artificial intelligence, um, even with blockchain to track key suppliers and components of the car. That's where blockchain is gonna be a great help uh, to make sure to, for, for quality assurance, it's, it's very important. Um, and also the overall digitalization concept of the factory, which I explained before, making good use of the data and having the bridge between the virtual and the real twins of, of production. So very exciting times coming up now uh, in terms of automotive production in, and in especially with e-cars. Now, in the other side, in, in elect, well, e-charging infrastructure, I mean, outside of the factory, once you have an e-car, then how do you charge the car? Um, and for that, you also require very intelligent infrastructure um, in the cities, in the suburbs, and also at home uh, to make sure that, that you have an intelligent e-charging infrastructure. You could have um, a model in which at home, you could have, for instance, uh, photovoltaic panels in your, in your rooftop. You could have a battery at home and a charging station. And, and you could use that whole infrastructure as, a, as an energy buffer, not only to charge the car, but also to use, use the energy at home at peak times, for instance, in the evenings, when the, the, the energy supply might be very expensive or the distribution network would be overloaded, you could use that uh, as an energy buffer. Even the batteries, uh, there is a concept also that, that shows that um, when, for instance, you have many e-cars in a, in, a, in a fleet parked in, a, in an in office building or, or, uh, in, or a mall, you could use all these batteries once the cars uh, are basically not used or parked during the day. You could use that fleet as a, as a big or large battery to power the building and then in the evening, when you use, you're going to use the car, then charge the car enough to get home. So it's basically a holistic view of the whole energy system, which is based on digitalization, what we're seeing here. So it's also Absolutely. intelligent use of e-charging. So it's very, very exciting times coming, coming up. Yeah, I heard about the hydrogen cars and they can supply energy for a whole town. And all those uh, um, new requirements or trends of the industry are uh, be, become into manufacturing challenges, right, Matt? So, <laughs> the, fortunately, there are also innovations in terms of the manufacturing, like the additive uh, uh, technologies or 5Gs in order to make all this happen. How do you see that uh, helping uh, the entire uh, automotive supply chain? Yeah, for sure. So the uh, the main goal is obviously to make the factories uh, more efficient. So. I mean, just in Mexico alone, we have over 10,000 employees in our 16 different plants and making those plants more efficient, 
making sure that they're making good parts at the good time to really give us that total customer satisfaction that we're looking for, right? So, so some of the, the, the key topics that are popping up with additive manufacturing is, is can we start printing parts on demand? Uh, so that would be a long-term goal. Uh, right now, the A surface quality, uh, the speed at which you can print parts is, is not quite there. Uh, but for instance, uh, Ford is using uh, additive manufacturing to print a, a low volume uh, button. It's a button switch cover uh, that they use. So, so it's there, you need kind of a niche low volume right now, but as the speeds increase, as the quality gets better with the A-Surf, it's, it's getting there. And, and Alejandro touched a bit on the, uh, the 5G infrastructure. For, so for sure, as we're upgrading our Wi-Fi, does it make more sense to upgrade to 5G, right? So as you look in the long-term plan of what solutions do we wanna have on the factory floor to help the operators become more efficient, to guide them, uh, whether it's a maintenance operation, whether it's a tool change operation or their standardized work, really with the 5G capability is, in your roadmap, do you have uh, real-time video processing that you need to uh, compute on the edge, right? So if you have an AI tool that needs to interpret some quality data, let's say, on a video processing of um, an A surface defect on a, on a seat or on an instrument panel, uh, you want to plan for the 5G infrastructure because it's coming, and it's coming in the next two or three years. So if your roadmap has that type of need for, for high connectivity, uh, fast computing, uh, really that 5G is, is where you need to go to upgrade to that as opposed to upgrading uh, a typical uh, Wi-Fi, uh, uh, a normal Wi-Fi, as we would say. So uh, a lot of exciting things, uh, a lot of uh, exciting innovations for sure that are coming to our factory floor. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, in real-time information, real-time uh, um, data can help us react faster. Uh, so. Thank you very much for all of you for your participation. I'm gonna say just that um, in, in, in my role of a cluster president, I invite you to get close to the, the, the associations or clusters, automotive clusters of every location where you ha are, have a, 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 a site or an operation because the clusters are becoming the, the table where all the needs and all the uh, capabilities are being analyzed and are, are being offered in order to have a competitive, uh, uh, competitive uh, uh, operation sites and uh, definitely uh, share in the market, in the new market that is coming, right? So 